This morning, uh, we are not actually meeting for worship together. We're doing virtual worship online. And the reason is because the bishop has asked us not to meet because of the COVID virus. Uh, and the government has asked for groups of more than 50 not to meet. So we are complying with both of those requests. And I want you to know that the church is still the church. And the church is actually the church still gathered. We're gathered in a very different way while we are socially isolating, but we are still a community of faith. This morning, uh, I will bless the palms, and the palms, uh, the palm crosses, will be at the front of the church. We will leave them there. I invite you, if you come to St. Albans for any time of private prayer during this Holy Week, to pick up one of the palm crosses. They are there at the entrance for you, each individually, as you come to pray this very holy week. Good morning and welcome to St. Albans. We are about to anticipate the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem as we celebrate this Palm Sunday. I don't know if you know this, but uh, before Palm Sunday, there's some preparations that go into preparing and making Palm Sunday happen for everybody in the congregation. One of the things that happens is somebody has to provide the palms because uh, it's not quite the same as when Jesus was in Jerusalem. When Jesus was in Jerusalem and the people see him coming, they grabbed what was close to them, the palm trees. They were able to cut down palms and put them in his way as a sort of a red carpet for him to come along and they would wave them. It was a procession. In modern day, we might think of it a little bit like a ticker tape parade. You took something that was common and made it very festive. So like paper flying down from the skyscrapers. But in Jerusalem, it was palms. Now sometimes we fold the palms into palm crosses because Palm Sunday is really an anticipation of the crucifixion. I'd like for you to notice something about this service. First of all, if you go to a funeral, at least an Episcopal Church funeral, it starts off pretty much in silence. It's somber, it's serious. The beginning of the funeral starts that way. But as the funeral progresses, it gets more and more joyful. So that at the end of a funeral, we often sing Jesus Christ is risen today. It moves from death and silence into the joy and celebration of the resurrection. This service is the opposite. We start with celebration, joy, palms, like a ticker tape parade, and we process around the church shouting Hosanna. Then we read the Passion, and it goes from Hosanna in the highest to crucify him, crucify him. It goes the opposite direction. It goes from joy and celebration to somber, serious lynching of a human being. This is our entry into Holy Week. We start with celebration and we are faced with the seriousness of what is about to happen to Jesus. It moves from celebration to somber seriousness. That is the point of Palm Sunday. Loving God, as we come to the beginning of Holy Week, we remember your triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We sing your praises shouting Hosanna to the Son of David. You alone are the true King, the leader greater than all others. Even so, in your great mercy, you chose us to become like us, taking on human form and living among us. As we celebrate and shout Hosanna today, may we remember what will soon follow. Keep us faithful in word and deed, and help us love you to the best of our ability. We ask this through Christ our Lord. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. When they had come near Jerusalem and then reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, 
and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what has been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them, and they brought the donkey and colt and put cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in heaven highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. It is right to praise you, almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along the way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. Amen. pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when Jesus was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But Jesus gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, there was a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to the crowd, Whom do you want me to lease for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who was called the Messiah? For Pilate realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests and elders had handed Jesus over. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And the crowd said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what would I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then Pilate asked, why, what evil has he done? But the crowd shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, 
He took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it for yourselves. Then the whole people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped Jesus and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on Jesus and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. As they went out, soldiers came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. And when the soldiers came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among them by casting lots. And they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over Jesus' head, they put a charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You would destroy the temple and build it in three days? Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking Jesus and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if God wants to, for this man said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with Jesus also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran out and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will save him. Then Jesus cried again, and with a loud voice breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly, this man was God's son. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was a former vacuum cleaner salesman disabled by an arm injury. He suffered a seizure and couldn't drive. He was a music lover who sang and played the piano and trumpet he had a beautiful singing voice. He liked to stroll around town singing. He was a people person, an entertainer who always liked to tell jokes. He was a father of three who loved music. He was a 48-year-old black man. He was divorced and served prison sentences for both theft and forgery. He was walking home from a bridal shower. He was picked up along the side of the road by three white supremacists. He was beaten and then pulled behind a truck until he died. 
He was dragged along a bumpy road by a chain around his ankles. He was desperately shifting from side to side to ease the excruciating pain of being dragged across the winding asphalt road. His heels were ground to the bone. His head, part of his neck, and his right arm were torn off. His blood and fragments of his body were cleaned from the undercarriage of the truck. His torso was found in an area called Huff Creek. His head, neck, and right arm were found a mile away. His name was James Byrd, Jr. He was a bright college student. He spoke Arabic and German in addition to English. He was a small person with a big heart. He was 22 years old. He wasn't ashamed to be gay. He wanted to pursue a career in the Foreign Service. He was an Episcopalian. He was majoring in political science. He attended boarding schools in Switzerland. He was picked up by two men at a local campus hangout. He was beaten, lashed to a fence post, and left to die. His skull was smashed by a 357 Magnum handgun. He suffered burns to his body and cuts to his face and head. He remained by the side of the road tied to the fence post for 18 hours. He was found by a man on a bicycle who thought he was a scarecrow or a dummy. He died after being in a coma for three days. His name was Matthew Shepard. When asked about her brother's death, Bird's sister said, everyone around here knew him. There was no ingrained hatred or anything like that. Another neighbor said, you never thought this would happen, especially here in Jasper. You felt safe here. You let your children walk outdoors. A crowd gathered around looking at photographs of Bird's killers and said, they look like normal people, don't they? A senior at the University of Wyoming who teaches an orientation class for freshmen said, the entire campus is in shock. Most of them can't imagine anyone with enough hate to do this. One of Shepard's professors remarked, Laramie is a fairly comfortable place, or so I thought. One of Matthew's friends said, I think about him out there tied to a fence for 18 or 20 hours. What was going through his head? A report in the Gay News Magazine noted that although Shepard's face was caked with blood, two white lines were visible on either side of his face where his tears had washed away the blood. Another student remarked, it's too terrible for me to even think that someone would do that. When we hear of such violent deaths, filled with hatred. We react in much the same way. We can't imagine how someone could be filled with so much hate that it would lead to violence. She is a senior in high school. She is very smart and an extremely pretty woman. She gets decent grades. She enjoys sports. She is 17 years old. She qualified as a junior lifeguard for the city of Santa Barbara. She is teaching herself how to play the guitar. She loves animals and tries to rescue them. She is being bullied. She is being made fun of on Facebook and other forms of social media. Her mother is frustrated beyond belief at the lack of help from the school system with the classmates who are doing the bullying. She has been so psychologically hurt by the bullying that she has been cutting herself with a razor blade. She is at risk for suicide. Her name is Johanna. She is my niece. There continues to be hurt, evil, hate, and violence in this world. It is the same hatred that led to the death of a young man in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. So despised was this Jesus that they spat on his face and beat him 
and nailed him to a cross and left him to die. It was a brutal, violent, hateful death. James and Matthew and Jesus died because people hated them. My niece is at risk for suicide given the bullying that has been going on. People hated and hate them for who they were and are and for what they stand for. That hatred can live in me and it can live in you. It comes from our fear. We're scared of what we don't understand. We fear the unknown and would rather kill it than live in the midst of it. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the crowd shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The next time we hear the crowds, they are crying out for Jesus' blood. Let him be crucified. Crucify him. Crucify him. How quickly we move from one sentiment to the next. How easy it is to become fulfilled with hate. Today, we recognize our guilt in the death of Jesus. Today, we see ourselves in the faces of the crowd that cried, his blood be on us and our children. Let us repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil that we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. May God forgive us for our silence in the face of injustice. May God forgive us for the times we did not speak up when someone made a racist or sexist or homophobic remark. May God forgive us for the times we just politely smiled at an offensive joke since we did not risk the, the judgment of those around us. May the blood of Christ flowing down from the cross wash clean our blood-stained hands. May God's mercy be upon us all. Amen. Join with me as we intercede for God's blessing. Confident that Jesus hears our prayers, let us offer our petitions with open hearts. For all church leaders, may they continue to boldly lead, offering prophetic witness to the gospel. For all people in positions of leadership, may they work tirelessly for peace and justice to ensure the common good for all. For families and communities, especially those longing for intimacy and communion, may they know the tenderness of compassion and joy of inclusion. For our own needs this day, we pray for those inflicted with the virus, COVID-19, for those who are sick, for those who are in fear, we pray for the medical personnel. We pray for our leaders. We pray for all who have died. May they rest and rise in Christ. Gathering these prayers together, as well as those that we hold in the silence of our hearts, we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Loving God, we praise you in a special way today as we celebrate Palm Sunday. Be with us as we begin our journey through Holy Week, that we may more closely align our lives with yours, knowing suffering and death, yet remaining hopeful in the life you promise. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. It's uh, following our service for Palm Sunday, and I thought uh, as long as we're here, we'd do another little educational piece. Uh, this is the cross that we carry in procession on Sunday. And um, coming back to my image of the ticker tape parade, uh, if you've ever seen a parade, in front of the band, there's uh, the drum major. He's got a, it's called a mace. 
and he keeps time with that for the band. But he leads the parade. And the cross kind of does that for us on Sundays. The cross is in front of everything. It's the procession. It's the leader. And it tells us where to go. We just, it's easy. Just follow the cross. So there's two images here. Um, one is, as we come in, we follow the cross. That's the point. We follow the cross. That's what we're doing in our Christian lives, is following Jesus on the cross. Another thing we do in Lent, we do this funny thing where we put this bag over the crucifix and we put it over other images in the church. Um, sometimes it's purple, sometimes it's burlap. This one happens to be a combination of kind of like pur purple and burlap all together. Uh, we do that so that um, we're anticipating really the crucifixion. So we're not looking at the, cru the crucifixion yet in the season of Lent. And then just in the spirit of Palm Sunday, it's quite common to put a palm cross up there because it's just something else to make the procession more festive at that particular moment as we're coming in for Palm Sunday. And so this is the altar uh, at St. Albans and um, it is decorated in the way that it would be typically decorated for Palm Sunday. The frontal is red and the color of the day is red and it symbolizes blood, is what it symbolizes. And we decorate it with a few simple palms. The lights remind us of the light of Christ. It's the reason we use candles in church, is to be reminded of the light of Christ. And the focus in our church and in our Eucharist is both the cross and the altar. Um, you might notice that when you sit in the pew, your focus is drawn to the altar. And that's because this is a place of holiness, the place where we are centered as a religious community. And even though we're not meeting Palm Sunday for communion, um, there is this theological uh, statement or position that even though you can't be present for the Eucharist, the desire to be able to receive communion is communion. That's provided for in our prayer book. And the most common example would be somebody who's sick in the hospital and for some reason cannot either eat or drink or is on a ventilator and cannot receive communion. So if the priest offers communion, just shows the host, if the person desires to receive communion, theologically we say they have received communion. Sort of we have baptism of desire, we also have communion of desire. So even though we weren't able to gather today for communion, please feel as though we are in communion with one another and with Christ, our Savior. Amen. <laughs>